I want to come to you first because you really are the, the person more than anybody in the country, as I said earlier, who has studied generations and especially this one. Paul touched on this uh, at several points, but what are some of the main ways this younger generation is different from boomer, boomers when we were younger, Gen X when they were younger, and the others? Uh, thank, thank you, Judy. I, uh, first of all, I just want to thank Pew for doing this study. Uh, uh, for those of us who have been talking about generations for a long time, it's great to have you know, all of you come out and talk about a generation. Uh, social scientists talk about the cohort effect all the time, but they don't often uh, talk about entire generations. Can you pass me just a, sure. I'm tethered here and I can't, I can't move. Um, <laughs> someone wired me up so I can't move. Hold, hold on one second. Um, thank you. Um, and as well that uh, you use the name Millennial Generation, which is, um, uh, I recall it was in the late 1980s when Bill and I were writing our first book, Generations, the History of America's Future, which was sort of a generational biography of America going back to the, to the uh, uh, 17th century. And we were wondering about what to name the 14th generation, uh, and we were coming up with different names. And uh, Bill said, well, you know, the first one of them is coming along in 1982. They're going to be the high school class of 2000. And I bet you ABC and all these <laughs> networks are going to have big shows about the high school class of 2000. What do you say we name them millennials? <laughs> so anyway, that's how the name, that's how the name was invented um, uh, once upon a time. I think it was around 1980. Uh, we made some predictions at that time about about millennials that no one believed. Uh, we said that due to their location in history, uh, this generation, by the time it became teenagers, would, uh, would cause a huge decline in many of the measures of social pathology associated with youth. We said that the crime rate would go down, uh, teen abortion, teen, teen pregnancy, uh, 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 some of the most dangerous measures of drug use would go down. And indeed, I think that was kind of amazing that by the late 1990s and shortly after the year 2000, we saw all of those indicators shift. And I think that's one of the things to keep in mind about millennials. Um, uh, they may say that the boomers have all these values and these boomers are, are so much more moral people than they were. But it's just remembering that when boomers were coming of age, we had 17 uninterrupted years of declining SAT scores rising drug use, rising teen pregnancy, rising suicide, rising rates of self-inflicted accidents, rising crime. Of that crime, the share that was violent was rising. Basically, everything moved in that direction. Millennials have been moving most of these indicators in the opposite direction, and that's truly remarkable. Um, I think, to answer your question, Judy, just about what makes them different, you have to talk first, this is true of any generation, you have to talk about location in history. Location in history is what shapes a generation. And I think it's very useful to think about that period from the mid-1960s, maybe all the way to the early 1980s, the consciousness revolution, what some historians call America's fourth or fifth great awakening, um, uh, uh, what Francis Fukuyama calls the great disruption uh, in American culture over recent decades. That was a period where each generation locates itself in a different way. Boomers came of age into adulthood during that period. And that's when we acquired our reputation for reshaping values, reshaping the culture. Uh, uh, you know, the, we, we were the counterculture. Uh, we were consciousness three. We were the greening of America. We were all of those things. And now that we're in midlife, we still think that all values revolve around ourselves. So, you know, back then, any discussion of values back in the 1970s was a discussion about college kids. Uh, older people back then apparently didn't have any values. <laughs> we never talked about them. And today, most discussions of values today are about midlife people. It's uh, red zone, blue zone, uh, it's culture wars, it's boomers arguing with each other. So boomers always go through their life telling other generations what's good and what's bad, what's right and what's wrong. That's just, that's how they're wired. But that was the result of that location in history. Generation X were the children of that period. And that hugely influenced them. They were the throwaway kids, the latchkey uh, and, and self-care guide kids. 
and they grew up at a time when childhood was, when children were basically not wanted. Uh, they, they're also the lowest, result of the lowest fertility rate in American history. <coughs> fertility rate reached its all-time low around the time of Watergate in 1974. Uh, and they grew up at a time when ch childhood was devalued. I don't know if you recall all the Childless Devil horror movies of the 1970s. You know, Rosemary's Baby and Omen and Damien and It's Alive. And, you know, they played to pack theaters back then. That was our image of childhood. <laughs> the millennial generation arrived when the consciousness revolution was over. And I think that is how you define its location in history. Boomers remember it coming of age. Xers remember it as children. Millennials don't remember it at all. So Woodstock is an SOL, SOL qu question to millennials today. It's as remote, remote from them as talk about the New Deal is from a boomer like myself. Uh, they don't remember it. They don't remember anything associated with it in their own lives. And in fact, when they came along, it was precisely a time at which childhood was revalued again in America. Um, this was a period, the early 80s, when suddenly things began improving for children. Uh, alcohol consumption per capita among all Americans has been gradually declining since about 1981. Drug use among all, all Americans has been gradually declining. The abortion rate, the divorce rate have all been gradually declining. Um, I don't know if you recall the early 1980s, it was the year of the yuppie, finally getting to settling down. It was family values, it was cocooning. Uh, in 1982, when the first millennials were born, we saw the appearance of baby on board bumper stickers all across America. Right? We'd never seen that before. And suddenly, all those childless devil movies, no one wanted to watch them. It was all these cuddly baby movies. You remember Baby Boom and Parenthood and Three Men and a Baby started coming out. Um, and then about 10 years later, there were you know happy movies about adolescence, movies like Sleepless in Seattle and, and uh, uh, Searching for Bobby Fisher. And, Today, in fact, a very common kind of movie, you see this all the time, these are kids who basically inspired their parents to become better people. Um, and you see this especially now when you have later wave millennials with exer parents. A typical plot line now is, you know, millennial kid puts exer dad into rehab or something like that. I mean, <laughs> it's just, we're used to that today. Um, at the same time this happened, uh, this, this new image of childhood, uh, came a new protection of children. And this is important to remember. Things like child abuse and what was in their Halloween bags and bicycle you know, uh, helmets and protective playground materials, all of this became into fashion. Um, fathers present at the birth of their children, even in the late 1970s, only about 20%. By the late 1980s, thanks to the, thanks to the Lamaze movement, about 65%. Today, it's over 70%. Um, uh, uh, so these were, these were huge shifts. The entire, entire home protection industry, all those gadgets you put on your plugs and your stoves and so on, that was a self -made, those are self-made devices back in the 1970s. It's incredible to remember. Parents just kind of made those themselves. That became a multi-billion dollar industry by the late 1980s. So all these things to began to shift. And, and when, when parents couldn't protect kids personally, they started deputizing government to step in. The last 25 years have seen one of the great child protection movements in American history. Uh, every bit as big as what happened during the progressive era in the first two decades of the 20th century uh, uh, under you know, Roosevelt and Taft. Um, you, you think of all of the laws now even named after millennials, you know, like uh, uh, Megan laws, or there's now a Code Adam, you know, some kid is lost in a Walmart, bam, all the doors shut, no one gets in or out <laughs> until that one child is found. But we're, we're very used to this now, throughout our society and culture, this new protection. And, and let me use that as a way to kind of get in the payoff, I think, of what you were asking. So, so what are the basic ways that it, it really differs, this new location in history? Um, one is the sense of specialness. They're special. They're special in the eyes of the media, politicians, their community, and above all, their parents. These, these kids have been raised with, with William and Martha Sears' attachment parenting. You know, they, 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 the parents are always around. And we've looked at a lot of surveys comparing uh, parents actually saying, you know, are, do I spend more time with my kid than when, you know, than my parents spent, spent with me? 
Back in the 1980s, those surveys showed that parents generally said, uh, no, I don't spend as much time. Today, decisively, particularly with parents of the younger millennials, they say overwhelmingly, I spend much more time with my kids than my own parents spent with me. So, I mean, that's an indicator of what's going on. Um, uh, teachers, K through 12 teachers, according to the last six years of the MetLife survey, say that parents are their number one professional problem. Okay, <laughs> these, these parents are in their face constantly. And one, one of the things I do when I talk to groups about dealing with parents is you can't straight on them. You can't say to these parents, get out of here, I'm the professional. You've just made your worst enemy if you do that. Okay, they have fear and loathing and hatred in that parent. What you have to do, you have to channel the energy. You have to basically say, okay, together we're going to raise this great child. I'm going to do this, and you're going to do that, and together we'll get You have to partner it. This is what colleges are now doing, these huge elaborate freshman orientations. They pass out the teddy bears, and all those boomers are crying, you know. Um, some institutions really get it. I don't know if you've seen recently the... Uh, the U.S. Army recruiting slogan. You've seen those ads, right, with the parents and kids that are looking at their careers together. But the slogan really gets it. Uh, you made them strong, we'll make them Army strong, right? Which is perfect. It's the partnership. And you see this. And now the new message is for employers. Uh, get used to, you know, meet the parent of, the, of these. <laughs> There's going to be a bring your parent to work week. It's coming. <laughs> And they're on the phone with their parents anyway, so you might as well just meet them. Um, and they're, they're telling their kids things about they should get benefits and make sure you get a pension plan and you know, stay there for the long term and all that. So they're, they're cheerleading for the kids. Anyway, get to know them. But that's one thing that's specialists. The other thing is the sheltering. And the sheltering is huge. They're aware. And, and you see, for Xers had a mixed feelings about sheltering. Because with an Xer, you sheltered him and they... Two thoughts came to their mind. First of all, they would ask, well, why do I trust you to shelter me? You know, <laughs> it's that natural skepticism. You know, what's your real agenda here? <laughs> and the other thing is, what's the message here? I can't take care of myself? You know, that's kind of the extra response. You know, I'm not tough enough. You know, what's going on? The millennials have no problem with sheltering. Uh, the millennial response is, I get it. I'm special. You want to protect me. I mean, <laughs> what, what's, what's, what's the matter here? I don't, I don't have any problem with that. Um, so sheltering is big, and, and you see that in every institution dealing with young people. Sheltering? sheltering. What, is it? Uh, what do you mean, what is it? Protecting, <laughs> providing for. Uh, pro uh, providing protections for kids. In other words, um, uh, uh, all of these laws and rules and regulations, just look at graduated license laws now in most states where you have to go through this elaborate procedure. Okay, now two and a half people plus a dog can be in your car while you're driving. Next month it'll be something else. Um, uh, another huge trend, and, and I won't spend much time, it's the confidence, and I think you covered that. The incredible confidence of this generation. It's causing them in the midst of the recession not just to take the first jobs that gives them cash, but to say, no, I've got longer-term goals. I'm going to live at home. I'm going to go to school. I'm, you know, I'm not giving up that longer-term dream. One huge difference, and this is something that we pay a lot of attention to in this generation, and that is um, this ethic of teamwork and community. Um, and you see this most dramatically in what they spend most of their time thinking about and doing, which is their technology. Um, and and I want to just touch on that because I think it's so important. People all often ask the question, how does technology shape a generation? Uh, and that's an interesting question, but it's usually the wrong question. The much more interesting and fruitful question is, how does a genera generation shape technology? Much more interesting question. Because if you look at that, you see who invented the personal computers and why. Well, it was Bill Gates and Steve Jobs in the late 70s, early 80s. Why? Because they wanted to get away from those huge mainframe IBMs that had been designed by their GI generation parents. The idea was that all the information went to the top of an information uh, an organizational pyramid. Someone crunched the data, and then all the orders went down, right, throughout the organization. Boomers said, no, we each want an individual think station on our own desk separate from anyone else so we can be personally creative. And that was the whole 1984 won't be like 1984 ads, you remember, in the 1980s and Apple and, and everything taking off. Gen X took this 
theme of individualizing and individuating the technology further with the internet, particularly with web commerce and everything they did. But here's the surprise, here's the real trend breaker. Millennials are taking this technology, and, and to everyone's surprise when they were growing up, you know, when, when they were growing up, they came home, and the first thing they wanted to do on the computer was, well, they wanted to email their friend, and then they wanted to go in the chat room, and then it was IM, and then it was Facebook and MySpace, and now it's these cell phones which have a little marauder's map. You can ch track every single one of your buddies all day, 24-7. But the point is, they're moving technology back to the community. And in fact, they're revitalizing and galvanizing political campaigns and community action through technology. This was not designed or anticipated by older people. This was driven by young people. And you see this in, in, in hugely higher rates of community service and volunteering. I mean, let's face it, for Gen X, vo volunteering was a punishment. <laughs> you know, you did something wrong in college, you do community service. And the, the Gen X would say, why me of all people? You know? um, but the millennials, it's more of a norm. And so that is huge. And, and, and maybe just one last thing to comment on is, is, is how conventional this generation is. <laughs> conventional in a very important way, and it often surprises boomers. Um, you ask them what they want to do as they get older, and they say, they have very conventional answers. They say, I want to have a balanced life. I want to be a good citizen and a good neighbor. Uh, according to the UCLA freshman poll, an unprecedented share say they want to get married and have kids eventually, uh, much higher than it was for boomers. Um, you ask them how they want to spend their time, and they say, I want to spend time with my parents. And it gets back to this whole uh, re revitalization of the extended family which is going on today. Um, and, and, and even their attitudes toward, toward issues like, uh, like, like, like gay marriage and, and uh, uh, minorities getting along, along with each other is very much driven by this sense that we should all be, we should all have a place, we should all have a family, we should all be brought into the mainstream. There's a complete absence of the stigmatizing that goes on so often with boomers. And I think in that sense, that underlying that is a great sense of conventionality. They want to take things and make them conventional so that we can all celebrate them, we can all enjoy them, and everyone can fit in and have a place that way. No one has to shock anyone, you know, like boomers were constantly doing at the same age. Neil, I let you go on a long time because everybody can see he's just a gold mine of uh of history and information about this generation and just some wonderful context that you gave us. David, I want to come to you. I mean, how do you explain, and this, this picks up both on what Paul and Neil were saying, given the severity of this recession, this economy, where does this optimism, this confidence that things are going to be all right for this generation, what's your understanding of that? Where does that come from? That's a good question. I. Uh I suspect if you look at the trend over time, the fact that um, young people have always been more optimistic than folks who are older, that suggests that there's something simply about being young that makes you more optimistic, um, which is, given the dismal state of the economic climate, um, probably a refreshing thing. I mean, I spend a lot of time with millennials since I um, am a college professor, so these are the people sitting in the seats in front of me, and I certainly see this, uh, a high level of optimism. Um, and I think it goes back to this individualized sense, this personalized sense of this generation that uh, they're sort of, you know, all the, the trends that uh, Neil was describing, this is a generation that uh, has had lots of things provided for them in an environment that's been supportive and such, that this is a generation that's been taught that you really can accomplish anything. I mean, I see that in the students that, uh, that I speak with all the time, that they always have 17 internships lined up and they have all sorts of ambitions and such because from, you know, knee high to grasshopper, that's the world they've been raised in, that they have been told the world is your oyster, go out and do whatever you want. So and that's like, in spite of the economy. Yeah, so it's not like they feel the rug has been pulled out from under them because of the economy. And the, the what is it, 37 percent, Paul said, don't have a job. Now again, so I think part of that is just youthful optimism that you would find at any point in time, but I do suspect, and again, if you look at that graph we saw, the, the gap between older and younger and 
and optimism is a little higher now than it has been in the past, that's probably because of this environment in which today's young people have been raised. Allison, I'm going to ask you to pick up on, on young people and faith. Again, this is something Paul talked about. But how did the fact that they are less attached to a traditional religion, uh, and yet, it, you know, that's, that's not, it's not just a purely black and white picture there. I mean, they pray more, I gather, than, than other generations did when they were young. Uh, fill, fill in some of the blanks there about young people and their faith and their connection to organized religion. Well, you're right that this is a very nuanced picture that we see here. Um, by some key measures, for example, affiliation and attendance, um, young people are uh, a little bit less religious than those who are older than they are, in some cases significantly less religious. Um, they, uh, they are also less likely to, to say that religion is important to them. But when we look at measures of belief, for example, belief in an afterlife or um, belief in heaven and hell or miracles, angels and demons. Young people believe in these things just as much as their elders do, and in some cases even more. But um, as Andy touched on in the beginning, there are several ways to look at this. We can look at these age differences at this point in time, but we can also look at what other generations looked like when they were a similar age. And as Judy pointed out, prayer is an excellent example of this. Um, young people today, the rate at which they pray is lower than that of older people today. But when you look at these older people when they were young, for example, Generation X in the 1990s or baby boomers in the 1970s, you see them praying at almost exactly the same rate. So there are some aspects of religiosity um, that are not entirely generational, but that results from the tendency for people to place greater emphasis on religion as they get older. Um, and so we, we can kind of see that young people may be a little bit less attached to religious institutions, but that this by no means indicates that they are more secular, that for them, faith, they may be navigating it in different ways and, and coming at it from different angles, thinking about it differently than previous generations. There's also, if I remember correctly, uh, a stronger interest uh, than perhaps one would expect in some of the evangelical uh, faiths. Is that, am I correct about that? Help enlighten us a little bit about how they're choosing among the different uh, religions that are available to them. Um, you know, our data for this report don't speak exactly to that, but there has been quite a bit of work done in um, looking at how millennials choose and how, or how young people, you know, decide what, what they, how they sort of put together a pastiche of beliefs and that they are much more open to choosing, um, finding a set of beliefs in different places um, that th more likely than previous generations to, to sort of tinker and put together these these different sets of beliefs rather than necessarily subscribing to one religion overall. Um, in terms of evangelical or not, I, I think one thing that stands out to me that I think is very interesting is that, you know, we can talk about millennials um, as a whole as a generation compared to older generations, but even the millennial generation, um, there are, are big differences within that generation according to religious affiliation, that those who are evangelical um, do tend to register much higher levels of religious commitment on many of these items than do um, those who are not affiliated with a faith, for example, and even those who um, belong to mainline Protestant faiths um, or to the Catholic faith. Excuse me, can I speak to that? Sure. Um, so on the specific question of whether millennials as a generation are attracted to evangelical Protestantism as a, uh, as a, you know, a segment of the, of the religious marketplace, that was the case up until about 20 years ago, that young people were being attracted into evangelical ranks. Um, and so if you look over the long haul from you know, the 60s to the 70s, you do see a slight increase in the overall percentage of Americans who were <coughs> evangelicals, but much of that growth was concentrated among young people. That, however, ceased to be the case. That is not the case over the last 10 or 15 years. You um, have seen evangelical churches sort of you know, remain on the American landscape, and anyone who's been to the Saddleback Church in California or the Willow Creek Church in Chicago, these are massive megachurches, will know what I mean. 
but as in terms of um, the evangelicals attracting the millennials, that does not seem to be the case. It's not that millennials are, are you know, streaming out of these churches, but they're not being attracted to them the way that young people were in the past. And what that suggests is that there's, a, there's an opening in the religious marketplace here, that there's a group of people that you know, the Pew reports have described quite uh, nicely uh, who are young, um, they're not comfortable with formal religion, but it doesn't mean that they're truly secular. Um, they just haven't found a religious home yet. That suggests to me that there's an opening for religious entrepreneurs to somehow reach that segment of the population. They haven't yet done so, and evangelicalism at ex as it exists today does not seem to be reaching them. Okay. I want to jump around a little bit because one thing that keeps coming back to me, Mark Lopez, is the diversity, the enormous diversity of this generation, more diverse than any generation. And we heard the statistics a minute ago, how many are, uh, uh, are Hispanic? Uh, was it 17 percent of this generation? 19 percent. It's jumped to 19 yes. just in the last few <laughs> years. growing. And, and, and growing. Talk about how that shapes who they are and what they think as a generation. Well, first on the diversity, there's a tremendous amount of diversity uh, among young people. Young people are more likely to be diverse, as Paul pointed out, than older uh, generations. And to give you an example, when we talk about people who are of school age or school, school children today, uh, about 20 percent, one in five, are Hispanic. And as Paul pointed out, among newborns, one in four are Hispanic. At the Pew Hispanic Center, we predict that by 2050, about 30 percent of the U.S. population will be Hispanic. So when we talk about moving forward, we're going to see a lot of demographic change coming from Hispanics. But one of the interesting things about that is, is that when you look at growth in the Hispanic population, a lot of that growth in the last decade has actually come from native-born Hispanics. Immigration plays a large role still, but actually more growth in the Hispanic population has come from the native-born. And when we talk about young people, young Latinos, we're talking about young Latinos who are actually, uh, two-thirds of them, are U.S. born. So much of the experience that they're having is actually going to be a U.S. experience, not necessarily an immigrant experience, yet they themselves, about 40 percent of young, young Latinos, are the children themselves of immigrants. One, at least one of their parents is an immigrant. So when we talk about young people, diversity is a big part of this. Now, what are young Latinos like? Because uh, clearly they're playing a large role in, in defining this, this, this generation of young people. And much of what has been mentioned today, I think Latinos are playing a part in that. For example, when we talk about how youth vote, when you take a look at the youth vote in 2004 and in 2008, you'll notice that, that non-white youth tended to vote differently than their white counterparts. And as the youth population becomes more and more diverse, I think you're going to see a, a, a continued sort of difference in how they vote compared to other groups. Young Latinos, for example, um, voted overwhelmingly for Obama, just as young African Americans did. Uh, young whites did vote for uh, Barack Obama, but not to the same degree that you see among uh, young Latinos and uh, young African Americans. A couple of other things about young Latinos that make them distinct. They're also, just like all young people, very optimistic about the future. They see the future. They see themselves as doing better than their parents. They put a lot of faith and a lot of value in hard work and in education. And so just like other young people, they are, uh, they're optimistic. And I think that you're going to see that they're going to, that they're, that they're going to, uh, that they see themselves as being successful, or, or at least the future will be successful for them. Yet at the same time, they face a lot of challenges. When we talk about some of those challenges, you'll notice, for example, young Latinos are more likely to be high school dropouts than, uh, than other young people. Young Latinos, uh, even though they place a high value in education, many of them are not in college. And part of the reason they give is because they themselves um, uh, have to support their families. I say supporting their families is one of the key reasons why they're not in college. And when you talk about teen pregnancy, young Latinas are actually uh, the ones who are most likely to be teen mothers by the age of 19, about one in four, compared to other uh, groups of young people. So on the, uh, when we talk about Latinos, we certainly see that, yes, uh, much of the div growing diversity of America is coming from the Hispanic population, is going to be coming from the Hispanic population in the United States. Uh, but uh, to a large extent, young Latinos face many challenges in, uh, 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 that, uh, that in some sense distinguish them from other groups of young people. I want to ask uh, whether it's Neil or Paul just to talk about how that diversity is shaping their view of the world, their view of each other. Uh, politics and the rest. Well, I, I think Neil said it very well. Uh, they want everybody to have a place at the table. Uh, it, it, it's baked into their value system. It's baked into the way they were raised. And it's baked into literally and figuratively who they are. The, the diversity that those of us our age look at and we say, we kind of look and say, huh, 
America really is changing. For them, it's not changing. It's the way America always has been. So it, it's taken as a given uh, that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know it, one of the most fascinating, I think we have this in our report. If you look at interracial dating, and, and, and we've been asking this question for 40 or more years, we and other organizations, well, the whole country has come from a place where the idea of interracial uh, dating uh, or marriage was not only a, a social taboo, it was a legal taboo. Every generation has marched north uh, over the last 40 years on acceptance of that. But every successive generation starts at a higher place, and the millennials start at the highest place of all. It's taken as a given that that is part of who we are. And then look at our president today, uh, a product of an interracial marriage. And we actually have a big report out there uh, about African-American views, about, about the whole idea of race, the idea of race and ethnicity which is actually terribly confusing. It's confusing, as we discovered, to a lot of Latinos who don't quite, uh, am, uh, am I white, am I black, am I a race, am I an ethnicity? And frankly, I don't think our classification schemes have caught up with the realities on the ground, but ultimately the realities on the ground will, will change the language. Um, <clears throat> when, when Gen X was young, I mean, coming of age in the 80s and 90s, uh, one figure of speech used a lot was the idea of a of a multiracial, multicultural society, suggesting a bunch of discrete races and ethnicities that sort of pulled a little bit in different directions. And that was also an era where, in the commercial culture, you saw, it of, saw a lot of what we used to call salt and pepper ads, you know? <laughs> People are kids of sort of very different races together. You know, you show a few blacks with whites and so on, and that's how we, we describe this multiracial or multi-ethnic society. I think that's really shifting now. I think for millennials, there's much more the idea of simply a transracial, a trans-ethnic society in which people represent all gradations. Uh, typically now in the commercial culture, you see ads showing people of undefinable ethnicities, hues that you don't know where, you know, <laughs> where that comes from. Uh, and I think this reflects the difference in the millennial sensibility. A uh, rising number of them, when it comes to census questionnaires, don't want to answer. You know, the census forces you to say, I'm, I'm a this or a that. They, they're really bothered by that. They don't want to answer it. There, there's even uh, some resistance that, that some millennials have talked to me about, about the way um, uh, 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 a sort of a multiracial and multi-ethnic training is done in corporations, you know, with sort of a where people are forced to confront, you know, a lot of the animosity between races and ethnicities. And a lot of the millennials say, why does it have to be so hateful? You know, why, <laughs> why, why does it, all this have to be so unpleasant? You know, have to drag us through all this stuff. You know, we're cool with what goes on here. We, we don't want all of that bad news and those bad vibes. And, and I think in that sense, and, and what, what truly comes across in the, in the Pew Report which I find really kind of stunning is the fact that despite the fact that boomers find it so easy to diss younger people, you know, they don't have work values, they're superficial, they have, don't have an attention span and they're entitled and they, you know, go on and on, all these things. Every generation, though, agrees that this generation is more racially and ethnically tolerant. That is, that is some, that's the only thing that all generations agree <coughs> on when it comes to a positive trait among today's millennials. I want to come to the audience, and as I do, just think about what you want to ask uh, the panel. But as I do, just David, quickly, because there's so much to talk about here, we don't, we don't have time to cover everything, is, is this question of increased civic engagement. Neil talked about how the, the great contrast with Generation X. What underlies that desire to give to the community? And, and maybe if it's connected, the belief in government, a surprising positive view of government. Well, I think it's fair to say that uh, the millennials have kind of a complex view of government. On the one hand, um, we do see evidence, obviously, that they're a heavily democratic group and that they're happy to call themselves liberals and they're happy to trust government. But at the same time, we don't see them participating much in um, formal avenues of politics. But we do see a lot of action, um, as has been described, in community volunteering, which has a different implication for how you think change happens. If you think change happens by changing laws and policies, then you're more likely to be engaged in 
campaigns and you're more likely to be speaking to elected officials. If you think that change occurs because at a very localized level, people get together and run a soup kitchen and they're not worrying about what policies led to the need for the creation of that soup kitchen, but they're just volunteering for the soup kitchen, that gives you a very different way of thinking about the way politics works or the way society improves itself or the way society solves its problems. The millennials definitely fall into the camp of a group of people who see change as coming from small groups of people getting together to do things. Now I say all of that in a very rosy, optimistic, aren't the millennials great kind of tone. And I do actually think there is a lot of merit to all of the community service and volunteering that you find among this generation. But we should not forget that at the same time, many of these kids are doing this because they know that that's the credential they need in order to get into a good college or in order, once they're in college, to get a good job or to get placed in a good medical school or a good graduate program and that sort of thing. And I know in my uh, conversations with students, we'll often have a debate over just how virtuous we should think volunteering to be. And it's often the young people themselves pushing back on me saying, well, I don't really know how virtuous this stuff seems to me because don't people just do it because they feel they have to in some cases, they're required, and even if they're not required, there's this heavy social expectation that this is what good kids do in order to be accepted into college or get a good job or whatever. And I actually disagree with that. I think that um, you could, it's very difficult to unpack motivations, and if one of your motivations is, I'm going to do this because it enables me to put a line on my resume, and another motivation is I want to do it because I really do care about the people in the soup kitchen, I think the fact that they're in the soup kitchen working is important. And the fact that there is that cultural expectation is probably, on balance, a positive thing. The, the very fact, too, that they actually want to uh, win credentials from big institutions and win the approval of older people by saying they did these That's things. That's a good point makes them very different from boomers. I mean, our attitude was doing something just to put it on your resume, you know. Uh, no way. I'm not going to do that for you. Um, so, I mean, that whole attitude to saying, I want to please these institutions. You know, I want to do the right thing. I want it all down in this big resume, you know, uh, says something about their approach. I hope the transcript notes the uh, hand. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see how the transcript shows uh, the gesture that, uh, that Neil Howe just made.